Hi, I'm Tony Northrup, and for my photography buying guide, I'd like to go over common underwater photography options that you have for you. A variety of different price points, and I'll start with the cheapest, which is this disposable film camera that your snorkeling guide will probably sell you for like 10 bucks. You can buy these on Amazon for more like $3, and of course, it's an old film camera. If you look inside, it's just a disposable camera that has a roll of film preloaded, but you can drop this off at a pharmacy or send it into uh, websites that develop film and they'll scan them for you so you can still stick it on Facebook. You don't get immediate confirmation of what your pictures look like and you don't, you have to wait a couple of days to get them, right? But they work just fine, they're super cheap and if you drop it and it falls to the bottom of the ocean, who cares, right? Because you're only out a couple of bucks. You can see that this particular model has a little viewfinder here. Now, it has a real optical viewfinder there, but when you're swimming underwater, it's it pretty much impossible to hold something up like this and try to see through it while you're trying to swim. So what you can do is you can swim with your hands out in front of you and look through this and get a pretty good idea of what your camera will be taking a picture of. Underwater photography is never a precise art. You don't get to frame it just perfectly like you might compose a picture above water because the water's moving and you're moving and you're just not in complete control. So you always kind of try to shoot a little bit wide and plan the crop later. This particular model requires you to crank the film between every picture. You push that down to take a picture and then you have to twist it. So it's a little bit of a pain, but it's not too bad at all. And I was actually happy with the pictures that I got from that. Step up from that is a housing for say a point and shoot camera or perhaps your smartphone. These are available from anywhere from like $40 to a couple of hundred dollars depending on the quality of it. Now you can see this particular housing has duplicates of all the buttons that are on the camera and they are just mechanical. There's no electrical linkages or anything. I push this button and it pushes through to the other side directly mapping to the buttons on the back of the camera there. Just keeps the camera dry and allows you to push all of the buttons. You're still required to look at the LCD screen back here as you're framing your pictures. And of course, you literally push the shutter button on top. The housing itself makes the camera itself much larger. Usually it traps enough air that it will actually float. So that's a big bonus, right? Because if it slips out of your hand, it's just gonna go to the surface and not to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> You'll notice that this particular housing has a flash diffuser built into it. If you decide to use flash, the flash will hit this and make it a little bit bigger of a surface area. You probably don't wanna try to use flash underwater. Lighting is gonna be a problem, but the flash is gonna hit all the particles and such in the water and just make it not a great picture. So this step up of using a waterproof housing for a smartphone or a point and shoot camera will work out pretty well, but you have some other options too, especially dedicated cameras. Now you can get a variety of different cameras that are built to be underwater and you'll find that they're a lot smaller and lighter than this because they don't have to have a separate housing. These cameras are never great above water cameras. They can do double duty. You can use them above or below the water, but you'll find that they kind of pale in comparison to the cameras that are not built to be waterproof, especially because the controls will need to be built to be waterproof so the buttons won't be quite as easy to use. The display will probably be a little bit smaller. It'll be a bit bulkier and heavier, but those are a good option if you're spending a lot of time underwater. You can also get dedicated mirrorless cameras with interchangeable lenses for underwater use, or at least there's one particular model. Nikon makes the AW1 and it's just a standard mirrorless camera. You can change out the lenses, but you can just grab it and take it underwater. So if you're a mirrorless camera enthusiast and you plan to be underwater a lot, that's a good choice for you. If you don't mind working with film cameras and you do want a dedicated body, I'll also point you to used markets, for example, eBay, where you can pick up the old Nikonos cameras. Oh, I just, Love the Nikonos cameras. Not only are they cool looking, but they work really, really well. And just like the new AW1, it's a camera and an interchangeable lens system that's designed to work underwater. So of course, all the lenses are completely sealed up and everything is has little rubber seals on it to make sure that the water doesn't get in. So besides 
waterproof cameras, one very close step are these sports cameras which have a separate housing. Now, you'll recognize this, this is a GoPro, and it's definitely the most popular of the sports camera genre, and it comes with a waterproof housing, so if you buy the GoPro, you don't necessarily have to buy anything else to get this housing. The housing itself makes the GoPro quite a bit larger, and if you're looking at this specific model, I actually feel like GoPro didn't well equip it for underwater use. It came with a housing, which is nice, but it did not come with a strap that you might want to put around your wrist so that it doesn't float away when you're not paying attention. It also didn't come with a viewfinder on the back. I had to buy that separately. So there was no way for you to see what you were taking pictures of or filming. It also doesn't float by default. It's rare for an underwater housing not to float. But if it doesn't float and it slips out of your hand, then it sinks to the bottom of the ocean. And maybe you can't get it depending on where you are. Not a big deal if you're in a pool. If you're out with a boat in the ocean, then the camera's just gone forever, right? So the GoPro is a common choice for underwater use, though in my experience, it's not ideal for underwater use just because you have to buy a bunch of other accessories if you're gonna get it. You have to buy something to float and you have to buy probably a wrist strap and you probably want this LCD screen too, unless you just wanna take pictures blind, which works okay because the lens is super wide angle. Now, this of course is a housing for a camera, just as these two were you can get housings for your big DSLR. This is the way to get the absolute best image quality because the image quality is limited to just whatever professional lenses and bodies you might have. Now you're only gonna wanna consider this if you already have a great DSLR and you'll also need a really wide angle lens, something the equivalent of like 20 millimeters, 17 millimeters on a full frame body. If you invest in something like this, it's gonna cost you anywhere from $1,500 to about $3,000. I have an Eichelite housing here. This is translucent plastic, meaning I can see through it. Some of them are opaque and you can't see through it, though I really like having the translucent housing because it allows me to easily see whether my camera is taking on water. I've never had it actually take on water, but I always feel reassured that I can look in there and see that it's dry. Sometimes I'll even put tissues in there so that it's a little easier for me to see if it does start to leak. But like I said, it's never actually leaked. So this is big and heavy and clumsy and it's completely useless above ground. You will hate taking this on vacation. You will hate carrying this anywhere. This thing must weigh 15 pounds. Now, that way it's not a problem at all underwater. And in fact, it has areas down here in the bottom where you can add lead weights because if you're going deep and you're doing scuba diving, then this suddenly under that increased water pressure becomes too lightweight and it will float away up. <laughs> so you have to actually add some lead weight if you're gonna be carrying it with you. A note about usability, if you're using a small camera like this, you can hold it in front of you and swim. And if you decide to stop filming, you can swim with both hands, no problem. But with this, you can't, it's just too big. So you end up holding it with both hands and then just kicking with your feet. And that makes swimming a lot more difficult. So you better have a pair of flippers on if you're planning to use this. Really, you can kind of one hand it, but for the most part, you're gonna need to have two hands on it. Now, just like the point and shoot housing, this has a variety of levers and buttons that allow me to control the camera's original mechanisms. So this is the shutter button and maybe you can see it there, it kind of moves internally and pushes against the shutter button on the camera that's attached. Show you a couple other exterior features. You can see this particular model has a tripod mount on the top. That's so you could attach, say, a video light. It also has, see these buttons here, that allow you to control the output of strobes that are attached on the outside. You can attach one strobe to each of these two handles. And in that way, you could have two separate lights. And two lights work much better than one light. And if you're going below about 40 feet or so, you're definitely gonna need some lights. Even right when you're snorkeling and stuff, some lights can help fill in the shadows and just improve the lighting on your subject. So while you might not need it to get a correct exposure, having some external strobes definitely helps. While this body, this housing here costs about 1500 bucks, you can easily spend a couple of grand on just strobes. <laughs> Underwater strobes are outrageously expensive for some reason, and even more so if you want strobes that also work with video, they can do both continuous and strobes. So I'll open this up and show you the interior a little bit. You can see that these clamps are just really heavy duty. And that's because, you know, you might have $3,000, $4,000 in camera gear in here and you don't want any of it getting wet. So this whole back pops off and you can kind of see how these buttons work a little bit. Just pushes on the back of the DSLR. There's also little knobs here to allow you to twist things. So this would allow me to 
push in and change the exposure compensation to change the brightness. And so obviously this has to be built specific to a camera model because even if you go from a 5D Mark II to a 5D Mark III, they'll move a couple of the buttons around and then this is completely useless. So if you decide that you wanna invest in housing like this, you need to find one that's specific to your camera body. This cable here connects into the hot shoe on the camera and allows you to trigger the strobes just like a regular flash. And you can see there's this optical element here which connects to the viewfinder. And that allows you to look through the proper viewfinder, though I've always found it easier to use this display here and just look at live view on the camera. You'll see lots of little gaskets like this. Every single joint here needs some kind of gasket and you need to take some silicone and get it on your fingers and rub all the way around it. That's true of these smaller housings too, though, just because there's less surface area, it's not as big of a concern, but usually do wanna rub some silicone on it. The housings will come with some silicone, you might burn through it. This attaches onto the lens and connects to either the zoom ring or the focusing ring. You can then use this dial here to twist it. Basically, this allows you to zoom or manually focus as you're swimming. I'll probably pretty much always just kind of estimate with the focus. Uh, you're gonna have to use a wide angle lens and these wide angle lenses will have a lot of depth of field. So you don't necessarily have to worry about getting focus precise. <laughs> I usually will just leave it at five or six feet. But what I'll normally do is I'll use autofocus to get it about right, but then I won't try to continuously autofocus because autofocus systems aren't gonna work great underwater because the lighting isn't great. Once you get it about right, unless you really change distance, you won't need to refocus. And the fact of the matter is you're not gonna be focusing on something close and then something far because anything far isn't going to look good. It's going to just be too blurry because the water's not transferring the light very well. You're always working within like three to five feet of yourself. Now, these housings will have a separate module that covers the lens here, and you can put in different housings for your lens, depending on the lens that you're using. This is a dome housing, so you can see it's curved here, and that dome itself has optical qualities. It shapes the water around it to allow the light to best transfer to the lens. And this is the right choice for wide angle lenses, which is what you want for the vast majority of underwater photography. If you decide to use a telephoto macro lens, like a 100 or 150 millimeter macro lens, if you want to isolate individual smaller subjects, something that's much, much harder to do, but might allow you to, to see smaller things or more far away things, you'll get a flat housing. Those wouldn't use a dome like this. You'll need this just if you use wide angle, which most of you will. When you're selecting a wide angle lens to use, make sure that the front element of it will fit through this. You can't look at the filter size or anything. You actually need to measure the outside of the lens because it will need to fit through the small space. And I mentioned that because the wide angle lens I was using did not fit. It almost fit. I had to make some modifications to get it to cram through, but I did finally get it to cram through. You'll also need to plan to put a diopter on your wide angle lens. If you found this informative, also check out my photography buying guide, which you can get for less than 10 bucks at Amazon or sdpcommunity.com. It has many hours of videos just like this. And of course, a full book. Hundreds of pages of detailed technical information about the latest camera gear, everything from bodies to flashes to lenses to studio lights, wireless trigger systems, whatever you can imagine. I've probably got it covered in there, so please do check it out. And subscribe if you wanna see just more free videos like this. I won't charge you for any of the videos on YouTube. Thanks so much.